Okay, so hello and welcome everyone. In this video, I'm going to do an introduction to information economics. It's relevant here because if you're thinking about economics of entrepreneurship, a lot of the examples and a lot of the things we actually come to mind more recently deal with information. In some, in some sense, information's uh, the good being traded or that you're talking about an app or talking about some type of platform. We're thinking about reducing uh, transaction costs and this is typically mediated through the flow of information. So anyway, so it's interesting thinking about information. You might think about this as sort of like an informational economics uh, interlude. And I guess the way that I'd probably position this lecture is actually quite a bit earlier in the course uh, in the future if it ends up being something that I incorporate uh, more generally. Anyway, so we'll talk about an introduction to uh, information economics and thinking about the kind of the specifics of uh, markets for information goods. So we want to think about the costs associated with information, kind of the unique cost structure. We want to think about pricing strategies that might be implemented here. So personalized pricing, uh, versioning, group pricing, specifically for information goods. And then think about some uh, key considerations like price sensitivity, network effects, and lock-in. And I've got like a later lecture that kind of uh, develops some of those ideas a little bit more carefully as well, kind of complementing this one. So firstly, we'll think about you know, what do we mean by an information good? So one sort of broad definition is it's anything that could be digitized or that has some digital aspect to it. So this could be textbooks, be magazines, be like this lecture video, uh, movies, weather forecasts, uh, so on and so forth. So in the in the uh, book uh, like Signal and uh, Signal and Noise, uh, Nate Silver goes into great depth talking about the example of weather forecasts and weather information. The fact that you know you could think of the generation of this weather information being uh, public and centralized by government through like uh, NOAA and then uh, NOAA and then uh, being released in various capacities by a variety of different sites like you know, weather.com, AccuWeather, and lots of others, where basically what they're doing is taking the raw information and then adding an overlay of additional features to convey the product differentiation, which is really interesting, thinking about how the market evolves based around the centralized source. So, so anyway, so very interesting. Uh, what more so, or what's more interesting about information goods, like contrasted from other types of goods, well, for Virtually limitless reproducibility is important, like infinite capacity to make copies. And so this is important relative to our discussion of if we're thinking about a market, how easy it is, how easy is it for an uh, entrepreneur or for any, any business in that market to be able to fully cover, fully serve the market. And if we're thinking about information, in principle, there's, there's not the, the same type of uh, physical barrier that there would be in terms of capacity to, to serve market. You don't have like a, a durable good that a consumer has got to actually physically take ownership of. All you've actually got to do is have some type of device that can be a receiver for the information that's being transmitted or accessed. And so then there's different types of uh, questions about, uh, about the technology around, uh, around that process. Uh, endless variety and ability to customize. So I mentioned that a little bit in the context of like the weather forecasts, but there's other situations where you have like, you know, some underlying informational signal and then the different uh, channels through which the information is accessed is going to convey some level of either interpretation or packaging, nice tables or different sorts of things to be able to you know, customize whatever is the format of the information. Much different transaction costs, much different search costs, much, much different consumer attention costs. Actually, like one of the things that's, that's interesting is to think about attention as a resource. That's increasingly more relevant if we're talking about information goods. So think about like a pr productive resources and think about the resources that consumers have. And you know, usually on the productive side, we're thinking of like land, labor, capital. And then I argue that entrepreneurial talent is, in, is an important component to that. You can think on the consumer side. Well, usually we think of like limited scarcity or scarcity being most relevant over like money and uh, you know maybe time but also attention you, we know this from like your own productivity as like a learner there's only so much time that you're able to you know kind of key in and, and perfectly focus on a particular idea there's a limited amount of attention span and you could think about this from the st from the standpoint of just like even noticing or paying attention to a product or interacting with it or whatever think about like the engagement me mechanisms and algorithms used by social media sites trying to capture and trying to 
uh, engage attention as much as possible. Now, if you really believe the story I just said about attention being finite, think about what happens when so much attention gets grasped by different types of media, and then maybe you have less attention overall for other you know, important things. Uh, all right, so in terms of identifying the features for the market, let's pay attention to supply considerations, demand considerations, and then other kind of implications. So on the supply side, we talk about production and then reproducibility. So information is very costly to produce, very cheap to reproduce. So for instance, like here I am making this lecture. This is going to take me however much time it was. I've got to sit right here. Actually, the way that I haven't got my microphone, now I've got you know this thing, which is actually keeping me in this situation. I can't move around very much. I feel very constrained. It's super distracting. So I'm incurring a lot of these fixed costs, but that's a cost I'm going to bear once. And I guess I'm going to talk about it a million times every time that you listen to this video. But anyway, so it is henceforth cheap to reproduce. So you incur one really large fixed cost associated with generating information. Maybe it's researching. It's like writing it up in case of like a book or a case of like an article or producing a comedic performance or uh, music or, you know, the arts or something like this. So very costly to produce, but then cheap to reproduce. Very cheap to give additional copies to other people via, uh, in the case of uh, apps and internet and so on and so forth. So that's really important because you've got this really large fixed cost, but then you've got very low marginal costs, almost negligible marginal costs, right? As a matter of fact, not only is the large cost fixed, it's also a sunk cost. So once you've incurred this large cost, it's gone and it's been sunk. You can't recover it regardless of, of what you do next. And so you think about trying to avoid the sunk cost fallacy, but think about, uh, think about the role of this interesting cost structure, especially relative to things like economies of scale and so on, so on and so forth. Uh, one of the once the first copy of the information good is produced, majority of costs can't be recovered. They're, they're sunk costs. Like once you've actually incurred the cost of, of generating it, uh, then the, the initial investment is sunk. However, the additional multiple copies are produced at zero or low marginal cost. And there aren't really capacity constraints on additional copies in the sense that there are for other types of goods. So you don't have to have a factory, you don't have to mass produce, you've, you've, or you've got a factory that's capable of mass producing it in, in, any, in any smartphone or uh, laptop or other, other device, right? Uh, thinking in terms of uh, additional examples and then the implications for these markets. So when you think of like an operating system, right? there's a massive cost associated with designing an operating system. Uh, think about uh, like telecom, mass massive costs associated with establishing and maintaining network. Think of like how long 5G has sort of been in the works. Um, episode of Queen's Gambit, cost to uh, write, direct, act, and produce, right? So generating a particular uh, particularly uh, particular uh, series, right? So there's a really large cost associated with, with making the thing in the first place. Then there's a near zero marginal cost associated with distributing or adding another, like having another user of that operating system, placing another copy on hardware, or having somebody else connect a device to the system. Now there's additional like costs associated with like, um, you know, too much, too much traffic. I remember walking out of um, Wildcat University of Arizona football stadium after homecoming game where they beat uh, UCLA something like 52 to like eight or whatever. UCLA had been ranked. Arizona was not. Arizona tends to show up really well for their homecoming game, and so this is like a this is like a big. Uh, big upset and you couldn't call anyone because the service is if everyone's on their cell phone at the same time crashes and actually anywhere on campus you weren't able to make a call for about 30 minutes it was wild so uh, all right so ability to you know cost uh, to cost to write uh, direct act produce is the fixed cost associated but now once it's been produced it's you know really cheap to have somebody else uh, somebody else uh, open up and then and start viewing matter of fact once the once the information good has been created, uh, in the case of like an episode of a of a series, once that cost has been created, uh, the 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 next part of the cost structure. If you think about the entire transaction, it's borne by the consumer. It's in terms of their own attention. It's in terms of the opportunity cost of their time. It doesn't there's no additional cost for for the most part for anything that's anything that's on Netflix, right? Uh, it's already been produced. It's just, you know, you can just you know, click on the episode or whatever and then open it up. 
um, there's no additional cost associated with the production. It doesn't mean that the transaction's costless because, you know, remember you're gonna you're gonna incur an opportunity cost of your time. And I think that's interesting. And I think that's important for thinking about the diffusion of information and thinking about the uh, thinking about trying to. I mean, what, basically, what you're trying to do is get as a large number of consumers as possible, large number of people as possible to view whatever was this performance or view or download or stream whatever was this show, right? And at the, at the time that's already been produced, the additional cost, the transactions borne by, borne by the uh, consumer. And so, um, and, you know, they're presumably receiving benefits that if they, if they have heard reviews or if they have other perceptions that they believe is going to outweigh the cost, but that's got to be the case. Otherwise, the consumer's not going to want to incur that additional cost. So what's the worst type of information good? Well, one where there's a really large fixed cost associated with producing it, but then where the cost, so the opportunity cost of the person's time or attention is high relative to the value that they're getting. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think a lot of really technical uh, books don't, don't sell so well. Right? Don't get don't get read so well. It's like it takes a lot of massive effort into generating this information, uh, and then there's a really large like uptake cost for the consumer reading this. And so, like I think about all the economics books that I have, and how many of them that I've read cover to cover. Maybe out of five hundred, maybe I've read two from cover to cover and the most of them like how do you use these things well as needed right you go to the index and you find what it is that uh, that you want to look up or learn more about anyway so uh, on the demand side information is what economists call an experience good experience good is one where you don't know about the true value of that thing until after it's been consumed though you can get a nice signal from other people so if there's people sufficiently with, with taste sufficient or usage pat usage patterns or taste sufficiently like your own you can you can benefit from their reviews such as like on Amazon or eBay or something like that uh, to determine whether uh, whether it might be worth uh, worth uh, uh, whether the the benefit that you'd anticipate would be large relative to the opportunity cost of your own time. Getting back to kind of thinking about the cost on the consumer side. Uh, so, for example, will I like this iPhone app? Uh, should I log on and read this article on a Wall Street Journal? And so, those are those are questions, the information goods, and questions you can answer. Um, you can only answer with some uh, with some air from looking at reviews, but you ultimately don't know until you've done it yourself. So the firm's solution to the fact that information is an experience good tends to be offer trials. So you offer some amount of free trials, at least one, maybe three, five, or however many it is on a newspaper site, uh, and then beyond that point, you're required to pay. Right? Another thing you could do is create a reputation through either branding uh, or product reviews. And you know, hopefully the idea is to be able to signal, hopefully send a credible signal to prospective users that, yeah, this is going to be worth your time. Uh, you could allow a snippet view. So 30 second snippets on iTunes was uh, sort of what they, what they went, what they went with initially. That was, that was kind of like a really, uh, that was sort of an important invest, invest, uh, advancement in pricing, right? So what had happened was historically, think about music albums being released, you'd have to pay nine, 10, 12, 20 dollars for the whole CD. You might only just want one song. And then uh, you know a Apple kind of broke this apart and was able to sell individual tracks to basically the lower willingness to pay consumers who nevertheless had a willingness to pay above the 99 cents or whatever was the price, right? And one of the ways that they're really successful is they're able to offer these 30 second snippets. Uh, so what what did what did I do? Well, I would just listen to songs 30 seconds at a time, and then hopefully it was like the 30 seconds that I enjoyed or whatever. And then eventually, you know, now I don't need to do that anymore. But that was uh, that. That's the other thing is the people with really really low willingness to pay can benefit, I suppose, um, even though that wasn't necessarily the goal of the company. Anyway, so uh, price discounts to new subscribers that can be important. Subsidized initial access to try to get people uh, uh, interested and engaged with the product. Uh, in terms of like other demand features, is the scope for customization, right? So uh, there's a tremendous amount of information on consumers, IP address, zip code, browser operating system, browsing history, purchasing history, cook, you know, different sorts of ways that they're able to capture information. Of course, cookies are the things that make some of those things possible. But the idea is there's a lot of information that the firms are able to, to get, and therefore they're able to uh, target how the information is, is presented on a particular screen. 
talked about this in other examples of pricing where you know maybe the maybe the price that you're offered for uh, a hotel on a hotel searching site is going to be a little bit different if you're on one operating system or another so there's the interesting case where those on uh, mac operating systems were shown um, the first results were the more expensive hotels and then if you went you'd see the the initial uh, offers that were shown to those with a with a, a Windows operating system were uh, were less expensive, and it, what they were doing is they're reordering. So, but that's effective because how often do you go beyond the first page of results? Anyway, so uh, these data are used to customize the experience for each consumer. Yeah, so product re recommendations, Google search results, uh, friend suggestions, uh, Spotify. Uh, YouTube video rec uh, recommendations and then online advertising more generally. Where you, you click on a site and then you you see a, an ad banner and it's something that you've been searching for um, you know weeks before and that can be unsettling. All right, so uh, here's a, here's another kind of example thinking about uh, these uh, the 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 way that information and the way that the ability to make digital copies has transformed lots of markets. Actually, this is it's interesting because uh, this is going to allow us to kind of explore a uh, relationship between kind of you know three related markets, maybe now even four. So this was from this was a graphic from the uh, lawsuit against LimeWire. This is showing like uh, U.S. album sales, and they're showing like what happened with uh, Napster. Uh, and so you know here have been like album sales. <laughs> Napster begins, and then this is their projection, predicted sales based on historical growth. Here's what happened to actual sales. Okay, so firstly, this is a trend line. So this is supposed to cap. They're evidently going to argue that there's going to be some oscillation around that trend, of course. Now, though it is silly to think that it's just going to go up in this nice, perfect, this, or optimistic, right? Uh, that's not what happened. Indeed, actual sales fell, and the argument that they are making is well, now people were able to download, uh, were able to, were able to uh, download for free, uh, you know, piracy via Napster and then uh, in the LimeWire. So there's an interesting. Uh, interesting reflection about what was the actual impact on the market for uh, for music as a result of the ability to make you know digital copies so here's this paper is an NBER paper showing and this is like just one excerpt from the paper showing album sales and concerts from 1995 to 2004 so here's what happened with album sales album sales are falling here's what happens with concert performances concert performances rising right and so there's an interesting interaction between the recorded music and then the live performance, right? And you might wonder, are they substitutes or are they complements? And it seems, at least from the argument from this paper, that there's definitely this complements aspect. And this is, this is interesting. Uh, you could think about the ability, actually, to be exposed to a large number of songs that you otherwise wouldn't have, wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have encountered. And this is not just because of uh, piracy, but certainly because of Apple iTunes, and then also now more recently Pandora and then Spotify, to be able to encounter and be suggested a lot of additional uh, music. And so, you know, you probably had that experience. I've had this experience myself, where, you know, as you know, listening through, uh, listening through a, a variety of, you know, nice, nineteen nineties alternative rock music, and one of the suggestions that came up was uh, John Morland, and John Morland's a acoustic. Um, a, guitar uh, performer from, I think, like Oklahoma or something like this, and had not previously heard of John Moreland, but then in decided I really enjoyed a lot of John Moreland's music. So a couple times John Moreland's been you know, kind of touring around and has, uh, has, has uh, stops scheduled in uh, Ann Arbor, and I, I just I canceled because of, you know, you know, 2020 stuff, but I'm hoping at some point to be able to go and watch, uh, watch uh, performance. And this is something that I wouldn't have ever thought to do because I wouldn't have encountered that music if it hadn't been for the digital suggestion actually via uh, YouTube's algorithm. Uh, so what's going to end up happening is ultimately I'm going to buy this concert ticket, um, and you know, I'll, yeah, I guess I have, have have purchased some of songs from iTunes as well so I guess that wouldn't have necessarily this is this one is showing including digital signals this one is like album sales as a whole I think if I remember and then concerts but anyway this is exactly making this point which is like you'll be able to reach new fans as a result of the fact that uh, you're you're uh, uh, reducing the access cost for an experience good so you 
like the interesting economics of why that makes sense. Anyway, here is the point from the paper, or here is like the key article or key, key key excerpt. Redistribution of digital good may increase demand for the complementary good, partially offsetting the losses due to the illegal redistribution of the digital good. Right. Uh, moral of the story, well, economic analysis seeks effects beyond the obvious. And I think that's important to kind of keep in mind. That's one of the things that we're doing when we're thinking about economics or thinking about applications of economics is we're looking for the non-obvious, right? And that was kind of the ethos of, of free economics, right? So uh, 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 Levitin uh, Dubner's uh, works. Anyway, so uh, properties of information, goods, and services uh, incentivize firms to form platforms two-sided markets that unite groups of users by facilitating transactions. We've talked about platforms in another lecture. There's a lot of examples of this. So Apple uniting third-party content developers and users through the App Store. Uh, Facebook bringing content creators and users uh, and advertisers together. And uh, Google with like advertisers and searchers. Certainly other, other platforms, uh, numerous platforms. eBay, Amazon, right? Like basically the large companies you think about uh, large uh, information companies you think about are operating platforms. So now there's this increasing value of users. I mean, you've heard like, you know, the users being, you know, being and creating the product. And certainly we have like content creators through like YouTube and, and Vimeo, uh, Craigslist and eBay buying and selling, uh, Facebook and Twitter, where the content creators are important, creating the value that then attracts others to that site. And that's something kind of unique about all of these is like you have uh, someone on one side of the market that's in some sense uh, serving a role like a producer um, but but in a little bit of a different sense between YouTube and then you know Craigslist and, and Facebook and where uh, you know in some cases you're actually bringing a physical product Etsy or you know eBay and like all these other sites uh, in other cases that you're creating something that others are going to uh, consume the information uh, itself as the goal. And then in either case, you're trying to make whatever is this value that one collection of users are bringing to the product as large as possible so that it attracts other users who are you know, in the consumer role. Anyway, so that's so it's interesting thinking about the value of users to companies and to, you know, to uh, you know, further business opportunity. Uh, then there's the aspect of like, you know, crowdsourcing and that's interesting as well thinking about okay well you know rather than having the information centralized on this platform then distributed right like Facebook uh, pulls together information YouTube pulls together information by coordinating a lot of content creators on this particular site and then others come in where the large mass of people come in to observe the content and then and then and leave right so here we have like YouTube beaming out lecture and then you know, people dispersed across, um, you know, able able to receive it. Crowdsourcing does the opposite, which is saying, okay, we've got all this information that's in the minds of lots of other people. Let's pull that information in. So Wikipedia is an example, like open source uh, encyclopedia, um, open source software. Think of like Answers, uh, and then uh, Mechanical Turk was a way to. I don't. I think they're still existing. Where uh, Amazon uh, allow you, you're able to. So economists were using Mechanical Turk to perform economic experiments, like you know, if you write down a game and you wanted to see how people would actually play this game, like a version of the Prisoner's Dilemma or something like that, you could send it out to Mechanical Turk and then people would uh, participate in the game uh, and receive different types of payoffs and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I've, some economists were recruiting users from Mechanical Turk to participate in games that were hosted in Second Life actually years ago, which is, which is interesting. Uh, anyway, so there, the internet overall, like why is this possible? It's lowering transaction costs, right? And as a result, there's things that are really good. There's things that are not so good. So there's the good. It's virtually costless to visit many stores. This has increased the level of competition for, uh, in particular, product markets because no longer is it like a single mom and pop that a rural area might be served by or a single Walmart that's caused the mom and pop to, uh, to shut down. Instead, even rural users are able to access a large number of storefronts, virtual storefronts, uh, the ability to compare prices, read reviews, and what's the effect on competition? Well, it's in some sense, it's made some markets a lot more competitive. On the other sense, it's made some markets a lot more consolidated because it's increased the returns for the big winners, such as like Amazon. 
Uh, there's also the not so good, right? Information overload. There's maybe too many similar choices and then it's difficult to be able to choose between any of them. Uh, this brings up the idea that it might be relevant, might be reasonable to satisfice rather than optimize. In the Ethics and Economic Behavior course, I've got a lecture on satisficing. And the basic idea with satisficing rather than optimizing is you're trying to do just good enough, right? And sometimes good enough is good enough. Right? So optimizing is trying to do the best you can given the circumstances. Well, actually, optimizing is trying to do the best you can. Constrained optimization is you're trying to do the best you can given the circumstances. Satisficing is saying you'll set some level of quality that you're looking for, and once you've got that level, you stop your search right? because what you found was good enough. Right? So there's some places, some aspects of life where satisficing is good enough. Right? So like, how much information do you need to seek out about a weather forecast? Well, if you're just trying to determine like, whether you want to bring you know, you know, an umbrella across campus or something like that, uh, you maybe just Google you know, you know, weather and see, does it look like Google's telling me it's going to rain? And if not, that might be enough information that you need and you, it's not worth it to continue your search. Uh, if you're interested in planning a camping trip, especially like a winter planning a camping trip, now you're going to care a lot more about information. So the, the barrier, the, the level that you're going to set is going to be a lot lower. You continue that search a lot longer. Think about satisficing in product mar markets, right? So like, what kind of paper towels do you buy? Well, whatever's going to be good enough to clean up this mess. But if you're thinking about clothes, you're thinking about something where comfort is going to matter, you're going to, you're going to set a much higher criteria. Uh, do you search around for the optimal shirt, or the op optimal uh, optimal uh, hooded sweatshirt or something? Well, maybe. <laughs> Some people might. Or you might just say, I just need a, I just need a sweatshirt. This is all I need. I just, which any one is going to be good enough. Uh, you know, so you think about the places where it makes sense to satisfy versus, versus trying to optimize. Uh, how information is organized and accessed actually really matters. It matters a lot for e-commerce. So if I see an online retailer for polo shirts, how should I see this? Should I see an option for every style of polo shirt? Should I see an option for every color of every style the polo shirt comes in? Uh, so you want to think about this. Uh, and, and then there's got to be some organization. So should, should we organize the default by price? by relevance, by best sellers. And thinking about like, so Richard Thaler, you know, won the Nobel Prize uh, and it, it had uh, uh, contributions in behavioral economics famously with Cass Sunstein wrote Nudge and now there's a new edition of Nudge which I've been meaning to read through because uh, I guess it's substantially updated. Also wrote Misbehaving. If you're looking for a behavioral economics book, like a good kind of introduction to behavioral economics, uh, Misbehaving is actually a pretty good book, a uh, pretty good starting point. It does a pretty good job of kind of talking about the landscape, and I think that's really useful. Um, anyhow, so uh, there's, uh, there's, the, uh, there's a choice architect, in the words of Thaler, that kind of determines like what it is that, that, that people are going to encounter. Uh, and so this, you think about like when you walk into a grocery store, where, where do they put the milk or where do they put, you know, the candy, right? And there's a decision to be made. There's a, whatever has been, whatever, wherever it's placed, I mean, that's, there's a decision behind it. It could be an arbitrary decision, but nevertheless, that's setting the context that people are then going to respond into. So you see increasingly, in, in the past, you put the milk at the very back of the stores, so you had to walk past everything, you put the candy right by the checkout because it's sort of an impulse decision. Now you see increasingly the milk kind of central. So people are seeing this as they're walking in or being able to come for kind of a, a really quick trip probably because of increasing competition from convenience stores. But anyway, so uh, there's a choice about how search results are, are organized, and that's going to kind of prime customers in a particular direct direction. So uh, do you organize the search results by price, by relevance, by best sellers, or do you organize by price, relevance, and best sellers differently based on what operating system a customer is arriving at the site with? All right, so uh, here's another kind of example. I think this is from uh, Varian's uh, uh, information economics uh, book. And so the example is uh, Britannica versus Encarta. So Encyclopedia Britannica, long history, was well established. It used to sell a, a set of encyclopedias for around $1,600. In 1996, Microsoft purchased uh, a grocery store brand to make Encarta. So for those, so years ago, if you'd go to the grocery store and you earn so many, so many points, now lots of times the promotion is you can earn points towards fuel, towards gas or something like this. 
years and years ago, like I remember in the fall, you could earn turkey tokens at the local Piggly Wiggly, and then you could buy, you'd get a free turkey if you had that in time for Thanksgiving. Uh, in other cases, they'd have uh, points you could earn towards an encyclopedia or a discounted version of the encyclopedia. So grocery store brands, they'd sell encyclopedias in the grocery store. Sometimes they'd have a promotion where if you bought enough or accrued enough points, they'd give you a free encyclopedia. And if you bought enough, you could buy the rest of it. Or maybe you could even just buy it outright. So I have some just random encyclopedias that we acquired by virtue of shopping at the local grocery store you know, circa 1990 or whatever. But, um, and of course, never completed those sets. I don't know where those are, but I had them at some point. Uh, Microsoft purchased one of these brands and then they used that content to make Encarta. Encarta was sold as a CD for about $50 to end users, though many um, original equipment manufacturers, OEMs, gave it away for free with, uh, you know, with the machine you know, preloaded with, with Windows. What ended up happening? Well, Britannica began the period uh, initially with like online subscriptions around $2,000. And they're trying, so they're kind of responding to how this landscape is, is changing. And basically what happened was Microsoft took this information, put infinite copies across, you know, lots of copies across every Windows operating system. And so this changed the market for Britannica. So what they, what they do, they wanted to focus on libraries. They figured, let's go to the highest willingness to pay consumers. Let's raise the price, $2,000 online subscription. Sales dropped 50% between 1990 and 96. Britannica tried an online subscription at $120 and a CD for $200. And then after 1996, dropped the price of the CD to $70 or so. Like obviously, like why is, it, why is this not gonna work? Um, not only do you have like the version of Encarta like on your PC already, but if you wanted the presumably higher quality Britannica, you still ha you had to have this CD. And so if you wanted to look something up, now you're putting the CD into a computer to be able to access the encyclopedia. And this just sounds absolutely ridiculous. Like, why would you, why would you do that? I mean, it, by, the, the, this, the, it, by the time you found a, a computer, I mean, now this is, but today, by the time you found a computer that would take, that had a disk drive, um, you would already have been able to find your answer via Google. But anyway, so in 1996, that wasn't quite the case. Most CDs had a disk, or most computers had a disk drive, so you could put the CD-ROM in or whatever. Uh, even so, even if you had the just very narrow version of the internet that was allowed via AOL, American Online, you could still get your answer before you you would have um, would have been able to get the CD to load and then find the program and every. It's just think about think about these things in terms of transaction costs. It's just absolutely absolutely ridiculous. Uh, what ended up happening? Well, uh, still regarded as the most scholarly encyclopedia, Britannica's last print version, I think, unless it's been updated, was 2010. Uh, and then henceforth, the encyclopedia is available online via subscription. My favorite encyclopedia brand is World Book. That's the kind that I had when I was a kid. I had a version from like 1986 and another version from 1996. And I actually, I actually purchased not long ago a copy of World Book Encyclopedia. I think I had the 2018 or 2019 edition. Why? Well, because if you have the encyclopedia on your, uh, on your uh, shelf, you can walk by and you can pick up a random encyclopedia. Just sit down. If you've got a couple minutes, you don't have much to do. I would rather sit with an encyclopedia, just learn about something random, than scroll, right? Just scroll on a device. I mean, yes, you can do this with Wikipedia, but there's something about um, having the focused attention if you just you have like a physical encyclopedia uh, and you just want to read a couple articles or read a snippet. These articles are really short. You can learn something completely new. I learned the difference between absorption and absorption, A, B, S, O, you know, versus A, D, right? It, by virtue of sitting down with the A encyclopedia about, uh, I don't know, two years ago. So that's pretty awesome. Anyway, but so uh, why wouldn't most people do this? Well, there's Wikipedia. It's less scholarly. It's crowdsourced. The quality is actually very high, uh, and it's free to access. In some sense, Wikipedia is a public good. And so if you access Wikipedia without ever donating, then you're free riding, right? And so the more that there's more free riders there are, there's less, uh, product, less uh, funding of the information good itself, and then the less production uh, less and uh, presumably lower quality. So uh, it's free to free riders, essentially. But, uh, but yeah, so we, given that you have more knowledge, <laughs> more pages, more knowledge, uh, more articles, more entries, and more updated knowledge, 
in Wikipedia than in any print encyclopedia. Uh, the prospects for a print encyclopedia just are not very, not very good at this point. Uh, moral of the story. Well, competition among sellers of the commodity uh, is going to push the prices to zero. In the case of information goods, uh, the, the high sunk cost, low marginal cost feature uh, implies it's really two sustainable market structures. You can have a dominant firm where there's uh, one firm uh, may not have the superior product, but by virtue of the size and scale, it has a cost advantage over rivals. Right, so maybe we can make this argument for like Wikipedia uh, over you know over other rivals. Although the quality for Wikipedia is better than people gave it credit for, uh, or a differentiated product market with many firms producing different versions of the same type of information. That'd be like weather reports, right, or um, you know other types of um, you know, other types of information where there's a lot more product dif differentiation in terms of like overlay features and so on and so forth around the essential core information. Uh, definitely, that's the case with like music, uh, uh, TV shows, comedy specials, so on and so forth. All right. So, what are some of the strategies, the implications for uh, for our firm or our, or our entrepreneur? So. Firstly, try to differentiate your product from rivals, add value to the raw information, like overlaying different types of uh, features, maps in the case of uh, in different types of uh, add-ons in the case of weather data. So uh, it could be useful. Uh, there's delay. So think about movies in the theater versus online and streaming release that having kind of important uh, important uh, element for price discrimination actually versus like the online version versus the theater version. Although. I think increasingly we're moving towards the online streaming release being much more important than movies in the theater. Um, movies in the theater, um, I I would suspect, I don't know, I don't want to say that's blockbuster, but I would I would suspect that we're going to see more Netflix than uh, more Netflix than AMC in the future would be my guess. Um, online versus offline. So you think of like magazines having the online version uh, and then the offline print version. Uh, there's some magazines that I like in print version. So I'd have you know Scientific American uh, and Wired come to me in print version. Why? Because again, if I don't want to sit down, if I have like a random five minutes and I don't want to sit down and learn something out of the encyclopedia, I can sit down with a magazine. Right? Um, user interface, you can think of the user experience on a Mac versus a PC. Think of resolution, high quality, low quality, uh, so on and so forth. And then differentiation in terms of customer service and support. That's important relative to the idea of always thinking about what's a useful complement that you can offer to enhance the overall value that a customer is walking away with. What's the overall value of the experience to a customer? And you know, customer service and support can be important important to that end. Uh, some strategies. Well, try to achieve cost leadership through economies of scale and scope. So large volumes spread the fixed cost out over many units. So try to get this, you try to leverage the uh, reproducibility to get as many copies of whatever is this information in front of as many people as possible. Uh, large volumes allow the firm to benefit from learning by doing to produce more efficiently. So you can see that in the cases where uh, there might be some uh, expertise or human capital development uh, that can, that can, uh, that can streamline the production. You probably see that maybe learning by doing with podcasting might be an information good where you see that relevant. Uh, lower transaction costs once a, once a large operation is established. Sure, you have a better website and uh, better you know, delivery mechanisms in the case of e-commerce or whatever. Uh, first mover advantage. So there, this might even be more substantial in information markets than a lot of others due to the economies of scale, the ability to cover entire market, and then network externalities. And it might deter further entry if the firm is dominant. Like it wouldn't be super wise to try to, you know, generate and develop a new operating system, right? Because Windows and then Mac are in fact so dominant, and there's just not so much of the market left to serve besides those. Uh, large capacity may provide entry deterrence. That's exactly like the operating system argument. You could aggressively price low to deter entrance. Right? You can't price below marginal cost because that's predatory pricing and that's illegal. Uh, but you could price you could price uh, lower um, than exploiting full monopoly uh, full monopoly power uh, as an entry deterrent strategy. Pricing strategies. So you could personalize your products and then the prices as well. So uh, know your customer, try to collect data and then analyze it. So registration and billing, right? So this is a lot of information. Act, ask for a diff additional demographic information customers are willing to share. Then you've got that data that can help um, 
tailor product recommendations. Um, you know, get information via the searches and the click stream, like what was the things that they clicked through before they finally made this purchase, right? That's information that Amazon has and is using, right? Uh, customized experience, so you know, product recommendations and product, uh, you know, um, and, and different suggestions. <laughs> There's a lot of interesting data out there. You can use the data, and it's uh, it's fascinating. So this came from uh, the site, and this, this searches for we broke up because taken from. Uh, whatever. So peak breakup times according to Facebook status up breaks. So here's uh, spring break, April Fool's Day, summer holiday, two weeks before holidays, <laughs> and then think of like um, you know, peak breakup times. Okay, so peak breakup times two weeks before winter holidays, uh, not right uh, at the winter holidays or spring break. Uh, so interesting. Uh, so firstly, here's some interesting data. Secondly, um, if the data are out there, yeah, you can believe that firms have this information are, are trying to kind of uh, come up with ways to you know, serve customers would be I guess the charitable way to say it uh, but anyway so I think it's interesting and thinking about like uh, uh, the value of uh, of the infographic and then thinking about uh, information that in this case Facebook knows about uh, customers uh, alright so uh, other pricing strategies personalized pricing so sell to each customer at a different price um, so dynamic pricing based on the individual's consumer behavior. We talked about this with Amazon's um, alleged price discrimination in like around 2000. They argued that it was just a market experiment. Uh, versioning, so offer a product line, let users choose the version of the product most appropriate for them. So this is like the freemium, so you can have like the free version and then you can have the premium pay version. Or you have newspapers online or, or in print form. Books in hardcover, paperback, movies. You have the extended version and director's cuts. Versioning is, I mean, personalized pricing is first degree price discrimination. Versioning is a version of second degree price discrimination, right? You have a couple different uh, alternatives and then the consumers are self-selecting into which is optimal for them. This makes sense especially if if it's relatively costless to provide different versions and if this helps kind of expand the overall uh, demand for the product. Uh, group pricing, so set different prices for different groups as, of consumers as in student discounts. This is third degree price discrimination. You can offer upgrades and enhancements, you know, target new and existing customers differently, especially if there's some type of switching costs or lock-in involved. And so this looks a little bit different in the case of an information good than some other in other markets. Things to keep in mind. So price sensitivity. If different groups systematically differ in price sensitivity, you can profitably offer them different prices. That's just the idea behind uh, third degree price discrimination and first, well, price discrimination more generally, right? Uh, but talking about groups, right? Network effects. If the value to the individual depends on how many other members use the product, product, there'll be value to standardizing on a single product. Right, to try to be able to get that, that network as large as possible. Lock-in, if an organization chooses to standardize on a particular product, it might be very expensive to make the switch owing to the cost of coordination and retraining. That's especially important in business-to-business -business markets, right? Where you have the business making the purchase on behalf of like, you know, all their entire staff, right? And think of like the retraining cost, the coordination cost to use a particular software um, or, or whatever. Right? And so realizing that lock-in is possible, you want to make really good decisions if you find yourself in the situation where you're making a decision that effectively sets, sets your future with uh, whatever is that product or whatever was that service. Right? Um, and, and, and the interesting thing is this is because of some other complementary aspects, especially like retraining. There, you know, training programs, learning about a particular software is a complement to the software itself. And so one of the things to keep in mind is the implications beyond the really obvious, right? So you make this purchase of this of this software system. However, you're also committing yourself to using that software system well into the future, right? Or making a potentially costly change. Uh, other examples of pricing, this is like two-part tariff pricing. So printers are cheap, cartridges are expensive. Consumers buy and then experience lock-in, high switching costs, right? They get the pr cheap printer, but now to be able to use that thing that's now occupying space on their desk, Right, you've got to have the cartridge. Uh, markets competitive ex ante, but monopolized ex post. We didn't quite talk about this with two-part tariff, but it's certainly a feature, right? It's competitive ex ante. So before the consumers are making the decision, there's competition between uh, lots of different printers, uh, different uh, brands, different models, and then after the consumers made the decision, 
Now you've effectively got a monopoly over that consumer unless they choose to incur the large cost or larger cost of purchasing the entire new system. Right? Several rivals to consider when you're buying printers, few options to consider when it comes to buying the cartridge. Right? That's an important dynamic, especially for markets like this. Um, you can think about that extending to information and other, other goods as well. So anyhow, so I'll go ahead and c conclude here. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, I guess I'll see you next time.